Okay, now this is session 11, part 2, where we're now going to chapter 7. And we're going to start off with God's seal that is placed on 144,000. So, chapter 7, verse 1. After this, after what? After what we just saw in, in uh, the sixth seal opening with the earthquake, the sun, the moon, the stars, uh, the sky rolling up, people going and hiding. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any, on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Okay, so what all is here? First and foremost, we see four angels that uh, are holding back the four winds of the earth uh, to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Now, most likely, th these are angels that have been dispatched to hold back the winds uh, that is going to be in preparation of the breaking of the seventh seal. We're not there yet, but the seventh seal, there's going to be a half hour of total silence. And stop and think about it. If there is absolutely no wind, no wind running through the mountains, through the canyons, no wind across the sea, all the seas are just flat and calm, no wind rustling through the leaves of trees, that is eerie silence. But also in verse 3, we have this other angel coming and he's saying what? Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on their foreheads. So uh, the, what this is saying here first and foremost is uh, the next three trumpets are going to accomplish just what they're being told to hold back on. There's going to be harm on the land, on the sea, on the trees. So it's going to be God judging on the earth, not people. But we will get to that later. Let's go back to, to uh, verse 2. Because he has what? The seal of the living God. He says, do not harm until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Now, is this something that everybody's going to see? It's like, hey, you got a seal. Hey, you do too. Wow. No, that's not, that's not what's being said here. This is an inscription of Yahweh's and Yeshua's name, or the Lord and, our, and Jesus' name, that will be readily visible to whom? To spiritual beings, to angels, to demons, to principalities, to powers. And basically, once again, this is God in his sovereignty that's going to say, hands off, do not touch. These individuals carry my name. And uh, let's look at a couple of passages that uh, emphasize this. Revelation 14 verse 1, then I looked and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name. So Yeshua and Yahweh's name written on their foreheads. And Revelation chapter 22, verse 4, they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. So, who are these 144,000? Well, if we just read Scripture and let Scripture tell us who, there's our answer. It's 144,000, in verse 4, from all the tribes of Israel. And then it lists 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed. 
from Reuben, from Gad, from Asher, from Naphtali, from Manasseh, from Simeon, from Levi, from Issachar, from Zebulun, from Joseph, and from the tribe of Benjamin were all sealed with the name of the Father and the Son on their foreheads. Okay, now uh, to the Jews back in the first century, they probably saw a glaring omission, and that is there's nobody from the tribe of Dan, and in his place there is the tribe of Manasseh. Manasseh? He came from Joseph. He was Joseph's firstborn son. So, um, so anyway, uh, that's the discrepancy. Now, why? Well, we're not told why. We're told what and not the why. And I see uh, my, uh, my conversion to an older uh, keynote slide has a, some a little cut off, but nevertheless, Dan most likely uh, was taken off because the tribe of Dan associated big time with idol worship when they crossed into the promised land. And you can see that in Judges 18.30, 1 Kings 12.29, and Jeremiah 8, verses 16 through 17. So uh, the other thing to keep in mind possibly is that there's a hint in Jacob's blessing to his 12 sons, the original blessings that was found in Genesis 49. And if we read that passage, Genesis 49, verse 16, Jacob is quoted saying, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. However, verse 17, Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider falls backward. I wait for your salvation, O Lord, O Yahweh. Um, uh, it does not all sound good, and we're not here to unpack it other than just to state that Dan is taken off the list in Revelation 7. Manasseh is in his place. You can read about who Manasseh is in Genesis 46 and verse 20. So let's move on. What we do know is that those sealed are from 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, once again, we know the what, not necessarily the why, and it's not explained. All we can do is speculate. One, one speculation that I think holds the most credibility is that these are, and boy, the, 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 the commentaries are all over the place on this. Uh, I mean, everything from, no, it's not 12 tribes of Israel. It's actually the church. And then, of course, you have the Jehovah Witnesses that go, uh-uh, nope, the 144,000 are us. It just goes on and on. But the one that I think is makes the most sense is that these 144,000 have been marked by God in, um, in his foreknowledge of knowing that they're going to accept him when the Messiah comes, and they will acknowledge uh, Yeshua as their Messiah. And so these are first fruits of those that are going to survive all this ordeal of, of Jacob's trouble that we talked about a couple of sessions back, uh, accepting Yeshua as, as Messiah and receiving salvation, which then gives them what? The key to the entry into God's kingdom. This seal also Remember, this seal is something that's seen by spiritual beings, and this seal would also identify them with the already sealed Christians, us, the saints, who are still present on the earth. And that's the reason why the Christians are not mentioned here as sealed, because we already have the seal. And let's look at some passages here. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 22. And who has also, what? Put his seal on us. And have given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. We have that seal. Ephesians 1 verse 13. In him you also, you being us, the saints, when you heard of the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, what? You were sealed 
with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance to the kingdom of God until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So the saints should not have to worry at all about this passage. Ephesians 4 verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed. For what? For the day of redemption. The day of redemption has not come yet. That will be the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, when he rules and reigns and establishes what? His kingdom. 2 Timothy 2, verse 19, But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone whose names the, the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So yes, we're sealed, but also we have to walk the talk and obey um, our Lord and Savior. So that's the 144,000. Now let's continue on in Revelations chapter 7 because there's another very important uh, passage here, and that's the great tribulation of saints. So let's first read the passage. Revelations chapter 7, verse 9. After this. After what? After the sixth seal and all that happened there and the sealing of the 144,000 when we got four angels holding back the winds of the earth. After this, I, and the sealing, and after this I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So they're sitting in front of, of the Almighty God. They see Yahweh on the throne and, uh, and the Lamb of God, Yeshua, sitting at, on the right of, of God the Father. And verse 11, and all the angels are standing around the throne and around the elders and in the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces, all the angels, before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So, well, we had the first half of chapter 7, uh, the 144,000 that were sealed that were all Jewish from 12 tribes. This great multitude is, is, is a number that nobody could, could number, and it's from every nation, all tribes, all peoples, all languages. These are the saints. These are the saints that are coming up uh, out of martyrdom. Verse 9, with palm branches in their hands. This is reminiscent of Jesus riding in Jerusalem in preparation for the Passover on a young donkey. Recorded in John 12, verse 13. So they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him crying, Hosanna, which means what? Give us salvation. Give us salvation now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Even that has a lot of meaning that we will unpack at a later date even the king of Israel, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. So, this passage, first and foremost, we'll take a quick time out. We won't go into details because that will be a separate session uh, devoted strictly to the rapture but uh, and all the various theories of the rapture. But this passage is the centerpiece to the pre-wrath rapture theory. And it's based on what? They're saying the sixth seal is announcing the coming of the wrath of God. Okay, well, there's a little room for interpretation. What exactly is the wrath? Uh, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt the seals, uh, especially the first four seals, is the wrath of Satan through the Antichrist and the false prophet. Uh, but is the wrath of God revealed in the trumpets, or is that just a warning of the coming real wrath that's going to be in the bowls, which we will discuss later. But nevertheless, they say the sixth seal is the announcement of the coming wrath. The saints of the church now appear in heaven. That's what we're seeing now in Revelation chapter 7, 9 through 17. We can compare that with Matthew 24. Uh, and then also, then 
after the rapture, this God's wrath is executed in Revelation 8 and 9 and 15 to 19, which uh, once again, there's room for interpretation there. But And nevertheless, this is their centerpiece. This is what the pre-wrath rapture theory is all based on, that Revelation 7, 9 through 12 is the saints being raptured out of the church. But the question is, is it? I think the answer is we need to read on because in verse 13, then one of the elders addressed me saying, John, who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? From where have they come? Very important. When an elder asks John, it's not, it's not for the elder's sake. He knows the answer is for our sake. We need to pay attention to this. And in verse 14, John, I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So if we just let Scripture interpret Scripture, we're told very clearly, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. Also, very interesting, there is absolutely no reference to any resurrected saints, none whatsoever, or being saints being captured off into the air, the rapture. Uh, and furthermore, the martyr saints in Revelation 7 is exactly what Jesus taught in the Olivet Discourse. Let's go back there real quick, Matthew 24, verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to the tribulation, they being the powers to be behind the Antichrist. And what? They will put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And we see all of this here in Revelations chapter 7. Uh, martyred saints are being put to death, hated by all nations because they're coming from every what? Tribe and tongue and nation. And also, these are Christians. Why do we categorically say that? Because Jesus says, for my name's sake. Remember, we still got two people groups here. We got the elect from the Jewish people that have not acknowledged Yeshua as their Messiah. And we got the elect from the church, the mystery of the church, which we have talked about in uh, Ephesians chapter uh, and uh, Romans chapter 11 that's the two groups and that's what's going on here now the verb coming uh, is uh, erkomai and it's used two ways in the present tense so in other words these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation and if we place ourselves into that scene yes that's present they're coming but it's also written in imperfect tense. See, once again, going back to the original language and uh, the verb tenses is so vitally important in understanding and how to interpret all this. Because the imperfect tense, what does that mean? Well, an imperfect tense is a past action that is in progress. Okay, so a past action, we saw this in the breaking of the fifth seal, remember? We saw all of a sudden uh, saints before the altar, uh, before the throne of God, being told to wait longer. Why? They had white robes, but to wait, why? Because more saints have to be killed, put to death. Very clearly stated in the, in the fifth seal. So it's a past action in progress. It has not been completed because we see it ongoing here at the time in question. So this tells us beyond a shadow of a doubt that the great tribulation is still in progress. Very, very important to note that. Okay, let's read on. Verse 15. They are, therefore, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. So who are these saints? These are the overcomers. These are the victors. These are the conquerors that Jesus Christ warned about and spoke about in his letters to the seven churches. And just as a, a refresher, 
Uh, go to Revelation 2, verse 5, where Jesus says, the one who conquers, and we'll, we'll answer that question in just a second, how you conquer, what? They will be clothed, thus in white garments, which we see now in Revelation chapter 7. And I will never blot out his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So these are literally... These overcomers, these conquerors, are saints that overcame the dragon that we will see in the parenthetical chapter of, of Revelation chapter 12. Uh, that dragon being they have overcome Satan and the Antichrist. How did they overcome? Revelation 12, 11 very clearly states how they overcome. They have conquered him. They have overcome him. They're victors. How? By the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony, they stood up. They did not denounce uh, their belief in, in Messiah, Jesus Christ, for they loved not their lives even unto death. At this time of what's going on, uh, they realize that this is a life or death situation physically, but this is a life or death situation spiritually. And they chose life, eternal life. Uh, now, is this something new that's being taught, or is this something that's uh, well-established and precedented? Uh, we will get into that. Let's read on, though, first. Verse 16, they, will, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst no more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. Okay, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst for no more. Now, why is that? Why were they hungry? Why were they thirsty? Well, most likely because what? They refused the mark of the beast. Because the mark of the feast, no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. And you could not do that unless you disavowed Jesus and what? Worship the beast. So therefore, they died hungry and thirsty but they shall hunger no more. And let's read in verse 17, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So there's a lot that's being said here that we need to unpack. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd in the midst of the throne. He has not departed the throne room. He is still in the throne room of God, sitting on the throne at the right hand of the Father. He has not gone up and gone down with his second coming, the parousia. So this is very, very important. Very, very important. And then God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This also very similar to what we saw in the fifth seal. Remember the fifth seal, what? We saw a bunch of martyr saints that were absolutely frustrated and angry and mad because of what happened and what? They were crying out to God, God, avenge our deaths. What's going on down there is total injustice. It's total evil. We need you to intervene. Well, it's no different here. No different here. These are martyred saints that still are carrying the knowledge and frustration of the evil injustice that resulted in their death. As explained by the elders, uh, by the elder, these came out of the tribulation. So they got this frustration. They got this anger. And what? God says he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, I know it's speculation, but my speculation is if these had been saints that had been raptured, they wouldn't have worried about that anymore. There would have been joy and elation of being raptured out of the great tribulation. Joy that finally, 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 there's justice that has come down from heaven from the Lord. But see, that has not happened yet. They just came out of the great tribulation. So let's read on. Because what's so important here is that these saints have won the victory. They have conquered him, him being the Antichrist, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death, which we just read in Revelation 12. This victory 
though, interesting enough, the, look at the paradox here. This victory was not accomplished by what we would think victory would be, which would be, oh, well, the saints, they came out, you know, and, and they killed the enemy. That's not how it happens. They were martyrs at the hands of the enemy. You see, it is victory through the sharing of the suffering that our Lord Jesus Christ had to endure. Before he could obtain the glory, before he could obtain the uh, uh, the, the ability the the uh, to be able to uh, the, the permission to open up the seven seals and start the days of judgment. Is this something new that we have to share in the suffering to obtain the glory? No, it's not. However, quite often the church chooses not to read those passages. Saints choose to ignore the suffering and just focus on um, the God is love and God will come to give us help, wealth, and prosperity. Let's read some passages here. Romans 8 verse 17. And if children, that's speaking of us, then we as children are what? Then we're heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs, fellow heirs with Christ, uh-oh, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Do you hear what scripture is telling us? It's saying we are heirs with our Lord Jesus Christ, provided we suffer with him and he has promised tribulation. Uh, in general and great tribulation if we're in that last chapter of history in order that we may also be glorified with him. A very strong conditional statement. Second Timothy 2 verse 11. The saying is trustworthy. For if we have died with him, that being Jesus, we will also live with him. If we endured we will also reign with him. Okay, now put this in the context of uh, what's going on in Revelation. If we deny him, that means we disavow our, the Jesus Christ as the Messiah and will in, in turn embrace the Antichrist. Um, I would love to put that in co contemporary terms, but that's another session. Uh, and we then accept the mark of the beast, and then we get food and we get water. Uh, why? Because we deny Jesus. Guess what? He will also deny us. Why? Because we're faithless. If we're faithless, however, he will, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Jesus Christ, um, in Luke 9, 23, he, he says what? If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily, daily, and follow me. So, for those of us that are retired and now um, we see life as nothing but taking it easy and accumulating toys and um, IRAs and uh, traveling the world and just playing it up. This paints a little different story, especially if we find ourselves as that generation that has to go through the Great Tribulation. Okay, so that finishes up chapter 7. Now, we'll very quickly look at the seventh seal because this is just something that's huh, short and sweet. <laughs> anyway, Revelation chapter 8, the seventh seal and the golden censer. So, let's read it. Verse 1. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal. So now we're finally getting to the last seal. There was silence in heaven for about a half hour. And then I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. 
So we're back now into a formal ceremony. In verse 3, And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. And then the angel took the censer he filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and once again, an earthquake. So let's quickly unpack this. Uh, we've already talked a little bit about the silence. And, and of course, one might ask, well, okay, that's the what? And why the silence? Well, the silence may have just been an act of solemn, re solemn reference before God. I mean, stop and think about this. This promise has been going on for centuries and centuries and centuries, and now everything is culminated up to this breaking of the seventh seal. This is a solemn moment, a solemn assembly. And what's about to be unfolded with the seven trumpets, it's all part of a formal ceremony. Uh, Zechariah 2 verse 13 might have done a good job of capturing this, where he says, Be silent, all flesh, before Yahweh the Lord. For he has roused himself from his holy dwelling, which is what we're fixing to see. Uh, especially uh, in the seven bowls. The silence is also, as we mentioned earlier, precipitated by the four angels holding back the four winds of the earth, which we already talked about. No wind, no noise. Verse 2, though, like the handling of the scroll to the Lamb, there is a formal ceremony here with the, with the hurling of the golden surf, censer, and that, in turn, is going to launch God's judgments of the seven trumpets. So let's read on. Verse 3, and another angel came and stood at the altar with the golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer, and we know what happened. He takes it, he hurls it down uh, with thunder and rumblings, lightning and earthquake. But the important thing here is in verse 3, the prayers of all the saints, you and me, our prayers are playing an important role in this ceremony, with the unleashing of, the, of this judgment, it, it very well might be possible that uh, this, this ceremony did not reach its crescendo until what? The censer is full of the prayer of the saints. So just like God says, we've got to wait until more martyrs come in that, that die as a result of the great tribulation. It's very possible that God's also saying, no, we've got to hold back until there's more prayers from the saints coming in to fill up the censer. Um, so this should be an encouragement to take our sufferings and uh, injust, uh, the injustices that we're facing today. I mean, stop and think about it. Everywhere around us, there is evil being prevailed. There is good being called evil. There's evil being called good. Uh, there is evil being legislated in our country. We got politicians that are standing up for evil and not for good. And those that should be standing up for good are cowering in the corners. So, Yes, there's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of ongoing suffering. It's going to get elevated. We know that. Everything's going to get ratcheted up. And there's going to be more and more injustice. We'll take it to God in prayer. And note what's going on here in Revelation. Note also that precedent has been set and passed too. Once again, where? From the exodus out of Egypt. Remember, this exodus account of of the children of Israel being rescued out of Egypt is so vitally important because there's so many, so much in, in parallels going on here in Revelation. In Exodus 3, verse 7, Then the Lord, Yahweh, said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. Of course, he's, he's all-knowing, he's all-seeing. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. But, very important, I have heard their cry. Because they're taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I've come down because I've heard their cries. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And to bring them out 
of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So if we put this in Revelation's terms, we could say, you know what? He has heard the cries of the saints, the prayers of the saints. It has filled up the censer. Because of that, he knows already our sufferings in the great tribulation. He is now, he is rising up from the throne and he's going to come down as the cloud rider to deliver his people out from the hands of the Antichrist, of the false prophet, of Satan, and all his powers to be, and to bring the saints up out of this occupation to his own kingdom, a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So anyway, we're going to stop there. Uh, let that to be encouragement for each and every one of us that our prayers do count. The next verse, uh, verse 6, starts a whole new, shall we say, chapter in this story. Um, remember also the chapters and verses, that was not part of the scroll that, that John was asked to write and to read. Uh, there were no chapters back then. But anyway, chapter 8, verse 6, Now the seven angels who have had the seven trumpets prepare to blow them. And that will be in our next session. So, amen and amen. Until then, um, be blessed.